Hi, I'm Ryan from Ryan Going Rogue, and this is one of my podcasts covering football, craft beer, and brewing, as well as the tech needed for creators to do what they do. If you like what you see, consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the podcast. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs Podcast. Welcome back to Locked On Chiefs. It's a little topsy-turvy in Chiefs Kingdom, and there could be some new additions on the way, or at least talked about. I'm here with Chris Clark from ChiefsDigest.com, and I'm Ryan Tracy from RGR Football, as well as Rogue Analytics. Story of the day is the Chiefs are definitely on the hunt for a new player in the defensive secondary. Certainly sounds like it. Mika Fitzpatrick got traded to the Steelers for a first-round pick and a couple of other picks. Uh, and Therese Paler has reported that Kansas City was in on that trade, but they got beat out by compensation. Uh, what that tells me, and I think you would agree, is that they're looked at as having a very low first-round pick. Exactly. And it does signal to me that despite what I said the other day, um, I did not think Brett Veach or Andy Reid for that matter, since uh, technically they're a brain trust. I know Brett Veach isn't driving the bus by himself. But they've been very adamant about how they're really happy to have a first round pick for the first time in a while. Right. And I didn't think that they were going to be willing to move on from that. But that report by Therese, who I trust more than anybody associated with what's going on right now, seems to say that that giving up a first round pick isn't the problem. I think what the problem is, is, yes, it's low. So that obviously lets anybody else who's willing to give up a first round pick jump you. But it's also the fact that I, I think that. Jags are going to hold out for two number ones, and I don't think that's in the cards for the Chiefs. No, and Trez Paler has also agreed on that one, that the cost is too high. You know, when you start looking at what it's going to cost to trade for Jalen Ramsey, two first-round picks, in my opinion, is too much. Uh, I think he's a fantastic player. He may be the best corner in the NFL. Uh, And if he was under contract for maybe two or three more years, maybe you do that. But considering he showed up to training camp in a Brinks truck, wanting a new contract already, He's going to want to get paid, and you can't give up two first-rounders without having a contract already done. And that doesn't even take into account all the stuff off the field and his, and his uh, ability to run his mouth. Well, I-, I tell you what, too. like The team, the Jaguars have already exercised the fifth-year option, so he's under contract for 2020 as well. I think it's 13-5 or something like that. So the new contract beyond that would be afterwards. So I, I can understand that. So. <laughs> but you're still not giving up two first round picks for a guy you're only going to have for at least two years. Absolutely. And that brings me back to my preferred answer to this whole equation in the first place. Supposedly the Cardinals wanted a first round pick for Pat Peterson. And if the chiefs are willing to give it up for Mika Fitzpatrick, they have to be able to give it up for Pat Peterson. Maybe you have to give up a third or a player to be named. Sorry, Reggie. I hate to see you go, but I think that's, what's going to happen. I'm I'm all in if they are truly willing to give up a first that there is better talent out there that I think can help them right now as well. Well, and I'm not going to say Peterson is maybe better talent. I think him and Ramsey are on really close to the same level. The and Ramsey is younger. Yeah, I just mean better than what the Chiefs have right now. Okay, fair enough. What I will say though is I think Patrick Peterson is much more of a proven leader and much more of a locker room guy that is not going to cause issues in your locker room and I think Jalen Ramsey could Uh, It was surprising to me to see Tyree Kill tweet out a welcome to Kansas City to Jalen Ramsey, uh, especially after the way he got injured. Did I miss something? I didn't say welcome, but he was he was basically making it look like he wanted Jalen to come to Kansas City. Yeah, and I Tyron Matthew said something to uh, Ramsey and his agent as well. Like clearly, the players are comfortable with it. I don't know after the Marcus Peters meltdown and the way that that pick went south. I don't know if the team's going to be into it. I have a tendency to believe those reports, including Therese Baylor, that say uh, that the, the team is not that interested, that especially at that price. So I, I again, come back to younger or different players. I, I'm still holding out hope that as, as the suspension goes on for Pat Peterson and we'll, we'll see what happens in Arizona, that that's still an option on the table down the road closer to the trade deadline. Absolutely. And you're right. He said, let's go to Patrick or to Jalen Ramsey. So it wasn't a welcome, but he said, let's go. So you have to think that he would be open to him coming here, which is surprising after the game uh, that they played against Jacksonville. But, uh, you know, regardless, at this point, I can't see Jalen Ramsey in a Kansas City uniform unless the price comes way down. Uh, and 
honestly, I can't see it happening because they would have to do an extension. Yeah, I know he's here for two years, but you're not giving up a first round pick if you're not going to hold on to the guy for more than a year. Yeah, and I will say this. I will say this. There's a there's a couple of Florida Seminoles that are on the Chiefs roster that helps some. And for Tyreek Hill to to be outreaching like that, the guy that he's been competing against, the guy that that has been the matchup, I think that says something too in terms of the, the respect and how the players currently on this roster might feel that they can get along with him. So that's that's more positive than I expected to be truthful. Yeah, me too. I just don't see the move happening right now. I think it could happen in the coming weeks, but they have a corner coming back off suspension in two weeks. So we will see if that happens coming up in the next two weeks. And when we get back, we're going to be talking with Kevin Ostriker, the host of Locked On Ravens. Can't find a workout that keeps you engaged? Peloton is an immersive cardio experience with real-time features that will always keep you coming back. Get $100 off accessories when you purchase the Peloton bike and get a cardio workout at home. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the promo code LOCKED to get started. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can improve your performance and have that extra confidence. Listen up. BlueChew.com. That's blue like the color blue. Blue Chew brings you the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, so you know they work. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on full stomach. And since they're chewable, they work up to twice as fast as a pill, so you can be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now, this isn't just for guys who can't perform. It's for any guy who wants extra function to enhance their performance in the bedroom. Blue Chew is prescribed online and shipped straight to your door in a discreet package with no in-person doctor's visits, no waiting in the pharmacy, and best of all, no awkwardness. They're made in the USA, and since Blue Chew prepares and ships direct, they're cheaper than a pharmacy. Right now, we've got a special deal for our listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free when you use the special promo code MLB. Just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's BlueChew.com, promo code MLB, to try it for free. Blue Chew is the better, cheaper, faster choice, and we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to Locked on Ravens. I am your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire, and we are back with our third Crossover Wednesday segment with Ryan Tracy and Chris Clark of Locked on Cheese. How are you guys doing today? Having fun. You? I'm doing well. Just ready for some football, some Ravens and Chiefs. This should be the matchup of the week, in my opinion. I think that with the Mahomes versus Jackson hype, this should not be a one o'clock game. This should be a primetime game. Do you guys agree? I do think it should be a primetime game. Uh, I think that this is going to be a very good game for them. Can we get a flex in week three? <laughs> yeah, see, that's what, that's what I'm hoping for personally, but probably not going to happen. Getting right into this Chiefs offense, I mean, we have to talk about Patty Mahomes for a second. Ooh. That second quarter, he had four touchdowns and then overall 30 or 44, 443 yards. And those four touchdowns, the game against the Ravens last year, the Chiefs played. That was his no look pass game. That was a game I thought the Ravens really had in the bag until that final drive on that fourth and forever where Tyree Kill came down with the ball. Do you expect that Patrick Mahomes will come out against this Ravens secondary that looked a bit suspect against Kyler Murray and have a big game? At 15, he's OK. I mean, he might try to exploit some things deep. I don't know. <laughs> I do think that he's going to try to come out and throw. I think they're going to be aggressive in this game uh, because at this point, they don't have a running game right now. Yeah, and looking at the rushing attack uh, in the game against the Raiders last week, 22 rushes, 31 yards. Shady McCoy now has an ankle injury. Damian Williams didn't really do much. Do you guys feel confident about this running back group, not only for week three, but looking ahead for the rest of the season? (laughs) No. Um, This last week was was a debacle. Um, generally, the Chiefs have not run a lot. They don't emphasize it, but they generally run well, and that is not the case against the Raiders. With both Damian Williams and Shady McCoy uh, out right now with injury, we're, we're waiting for an update to see if one of them will be able to go or whether it will be the young end. So it could be a, a very unique look at the Chiefs' backfield come uh, kickoff for the Ravens. Right, and I think that the biggest takeaway from this Raiders game last week was Demarcus Robinson, a guy out of Florida who not many people have heard of, but with the injury to Tyreek Hill, has really come on in six receptions, 172 yards, and two touchdowns. The Chiefs also have Miko Hardman to be kind of that speed guy as well. He had four receptions for 61 yards and that touchdown. It's, some people thought the Chiefs would be struggling without Tyreek Hill in their lineup, but the duo of Robinson and Hardman have really come on strong. Do you have confidence in these guys? Because with Earl Thomas in our defensive backfield, Tony Jefferson, Brandon Carr, Marlon Humphrey, just to name a few, 
the Ravens secondary is the deepest and the strength of this defense. So what do you expect their receivers to do against the secondary? Well, I think that the receivers are going to have a little bit of a harder time than they had against the Raiders. I think your secondary is a lot better than Oakland's secondary. But when you watch what Patrick Mahomes was able to do in the first game against uh, Jacksonville, Jacksonville has a fantastic secondary. Uh, they're a little suspect at safety right now. That's obviously a strong suit for the Ravens. I do think that it's going to be a little bit of a different game plan. I think one of the bigger keys in this game, though, is going to be Andy Reid's ability to scheme up and scheme openings for different players. Uh, he has done fantastic getting Sammy Watkins open in this last game is Demarcus Robinson. Travis Kelsey has still been effective. And then you have other guys uh, like McCall Hardman who had that long touchdown and then had another long touchdown that got called back because of a penalty. I think that they have enough weapons out there. Uh, the question is, is, is Baltimore secondary going to be able to slow them down because it's misdirection, which is really what's causing most of Kansas City's openings. And speaking of that offensive line, you mentioned the penalty that got that touchdown called back. Can you give me a brief rundown of how this offensive line is looking? Oof. Uh, work in progress is the way to put it. Uh, with Eric Fisher out, who is one of the anchors of this group, uh, and, and I do not believe he'll be anywhere close to playing for the Ravens. I could be surprised. But as it stands right now, we're expecting him not to play. Uh, that leaves the, the old man of the group in Mitch Schwartz over on, on the right side of the offense, uh, looking like the leader, uh, Laurent Duvernay-Tardif. Uh, the two of them together are going to man that side pretty well. And you have a young player at left guard in Andrew Wiling, who's, who's nasty and powerful, but has not seen a whole lot from that particular position. And Cam Irving, uh, who's been a journeyman, uh, kind of a Swiss Army knife, will most likely get the start at left tackle. And that's definitely something that they're going to have to try and protect and work some of their protection schemes to overcompensate for. Yeah, and looking at the defense now, looking at, you know, the Chiefs had a weakness in their team really what was the whole defense and the Bob Sutton was fired they brought in someone new and overall the defense has looked a lot better in my eyes but looking at the secondary Tyron Matthew a big signing Prashad Breeland Kyle Fuller all guys who came in and have made an impact do you guys confident in the secondary and their ability to hold Lamar Jackson to a reasonable number through the air this week you know, I think the secondary is being reworked right now. I think that they're still trying to find who they are and who they're going to be. I do think that it is, uh, I think that what you see from Lamar Jackson, it looks like it's a little bit of a different situation than what he had last year, what he was able to do last year. Um, I do think that they're going to be able to slow him down a little bit. Are they going to be able to stop him? I'm not sure. But you look at what the Raiders were able to do in the first quarter. They went and scored 10 points. They moved the ball up and down the field. Move, you know, got like 150 yards in the first quarter and then did nothing almost the rest of the game. Kansas City's defense is starting to figure things out and they're starting to gel. I think that's a big thing. Whether or not they're able to slow down Lamar Jackson, I guess we'll have to find out on Sunday. Right. And now talking about the other big acquisition for the Chiefs, Frank Clark, he ha only has two tackles this season, but he does have an interception, which is not what you're expecting from a guy who really is just a sack guy. And Last year with the Seahawks, he ended up having 14 of them. Do you, accept, do you expect Clark to turn on the Jets and maybe get a sack or two against the elusive Jackson, or do you think the Ravens offensive black can hold him in check? You know, my question is going to be whether the Ravens staff chooses to go at him with just the offensive line. Uh, the amount of chips from both the backfield and the tight end sets, and I, I like the Ravens' tight end sets. I feel like they can get some, some good work done against uh, what the Chiefs are trying to become. But I think Frank Clark is more than just a sack guy. He plays the run very well. He can beat double teams. He ha his play strength is is more so than you expect from what a lot of folks consider a you know a bend edge rusher. I think he plays with more power than bend to tell you the truth. And the interception was a fluke, but I, I feel like he's going to be able to put a, a well rounded game and if nothing else, pull attention away from Alex Okafor and Chris Jones. Yeah, and. Looking at Lamar Jackson, us Ravens fans know a lot about Lamar. We've been watching him for over a year now, ever since he got drafted, watching his progression. But with you guys being on the outside and being Chiefs fans, what have you seen? And what is the Chiefs fans' perspective on Lamar Jackson? You know, honestly, I haven't been able to watch a lot of Lamar Jackson. What I will say, though, is that it does look like from the little I've been able to see so far this year, I will be watching a little bit more as the week goes on. It looks like he's progressing in in, in uh, his um, development, 
Uh, it looks like he's a little bit more comfortable in the pocket than he was last year. It looks like he's trying to throw more than, you know, looking to run as opposed to uh, what he was doing last year, which I think he was looking more to run uh, this year. I think he's looking more to throw. Uh, he's still really young. Uh, I, I think he's going to be much better this year than he was last year. Uh, the question is, is, you know, are they going to my big question when it comes to the chiefs defense versus Lamar Jackson is, is Lamar Jackson going to hold the ball for more than two and a half seconds? Because yes, Frank Clark hasn't had sacks, but the reason he hasn't had sacks is because the QBs have been getting the ball out so quickly. So if Jackson is able to hit his first or second read, that slows down the chiefs defense and that slows down Frank Clark's ability to get to the QB. But that's a big key in this game. And that makes sense. Me being a Ravens fan, it does hurt to say that I expect this to be a loss, but I I had I have the Ravens going four and one over the first five games with the loss coming in Kansas City, and if that's the one loss that we take, I'm totally they're all right with it. I'll probably say an offensive shootout, probably thirty five twenty eight. So that's my prediction. But thank you guys. When we get back, they are going to be grilling me about the Ravens, and I'm going to be giving them my perspective on the Chiefs. So stay tuned for that, and we will be right back. If you found a hundred on the street, would you pick it up or would you keep walking? Of course you take the money. So why do you keep picking winners and not betting on them? That's why I go to my bookie. It's fast, it's easy, and they pay you when you win. Let's face it, where you're betting is just as important as who you're betting on. I wouldn't be telling you guys to bet with them if they weren't the best. Do the smart thing if you're going to bet this football season, bet with my bookie. Did you know you could bet on games after kickoff? If by the second half it looks like your bet is going to lose, you can always just take the other side. If you're the kind of guy that likes to bet a little and win a lot, try a parlay. If all your picks come through, you'll multiply your winnings. And no matter how you bet, the NFL season is the best time of year. Join now and MyBookie will double your first deposit. Use promo code Locked On to activate the offer. That's promo code Locked On. Visit MyBookie.ag today. You play, you win, and you get paid. Folks, we're going to welcome in and, and get some inside info on this Ravens team that I think really is catching the league by storm right now. And first and foremost, we have to look at the quarterback and tell me just exactly what Lamar Jackson is becoming and where is he in his progression right now? Well, Ravens fans are extremely excited about where Lamar Jackson is headed, not only for this season, but for the rest of his career. As the offseason progressed this year, he really put an emphasis on improving his footwork, improving his accuracy, and improving his decision-making. We saw last year in the seven games that he started that he was really just getting used to the speed of the NFL game. He was using his legs quite a bit. He had 147 rushes last year, which was the most by a quarterback in NFL history in a single season. So when you're looking at Lamar Jackson, outside fans think that he's, I hate to say it, a running back. So when Lamar came out and threw for over 300 yards and five touchdowns against Miami, People were shocked, but Ravens fans were not because we've seen this, this progression from him. He changed the th his throwing motion to be more of an overhead throwing motion instead of a sidearm pass that we were used to seeing last year. The Ravens want to make sure that the game flow really dictates either arm or legs for Jackson. They don't want to call a game that's specifically for his legs or for his arm. And we saw this against the Cardinals last week where it was a third and 11 and the Ravens were nursing a six point lead with just over three minutes to go. And you would expect the Ravens to just run, try to run the clock out, but the Ravens put it in Lamar Jackson's hands, and he threw a 41-yard bomb to Marquise Brown to seal the game. So overall, Lamar Jackson is becoming a passer, and he's really growing right before Ravens fans' eyes. Well, and you start looking at Lamar Jackson, and I'm glad you brought up Marquise Brown because I think that is going to be a fun matchup to watch this week. But I think it's also going to be fun to watch the development of both those players over the next several seasons. What have you seen so far from Brown this year? Well, what everybody likes about Marquise Brown is his speed. They had him clocking in at around 4-3. He didn't run the 40-yard dash at the Combine because he did suffer a serious foot injury in the Big Ten Championship game. But what Marquise Brown brings to the Ravens is not just his speed, but his ability to really be a shifty player who can run a screen on the outside, who can run a slant. We saw on Marquise's first catch of the young season in Miami, he took a slant play and ran it 40-some yards for a touchdown on a play where he just burned everybody on the field. And last week, he had eight catches in a variety of different ways. He had a few deep balls that he caught, but he also ran a few out route screens. He ran a few slants, a few curls, comebacks. He did everything the Ravens asked him to. He has a lot surer hands than people think. And while Marquise is a pretty small guy, he's about 5'9", 170 pounds, which 
you think is quite small, which it is, but he plays a lot bigger than his size and he gets down. He knows he has a small frame and he knows that one hit could potentially end his season. So when he sees a safety coming up in the front about to, you know, knock, knock him out, he just dives to the ground. He will literally just flop to the ground. So what Marquise has shown Ravens fans over the first two games is that he might already be the best Ravens wide receiver ever taken in the first round by the team. We have players like Mark Clayton, Brashad Perriman, to name a few. But Marquise has shown that he's not just a one-trick pony as a deep threat. He can do a lot of different things. Kevin, I got to tell you, just between you and me, because since no one's listening, I'm mad. The Ravens really frustrated me by taking Brown, first and foremost, my wide receiver one in the 2019 Mm -hmm. draft. But the other thing they did is just when all of Chiefs Kingdom felt like they had this safety position locked down and old Earl was coming to town and the Ravens drop in with some kind of contract offer out of the heavens. Tell me exactly why they did it and what has Earl Thomas brought to this secondary? Well, first of all, the Ravens did this because they lost their defensive leader, and one of them at least, in Eric Weddle. The Ravens offseason was marred by the losses of a lot of defensive starters, Eric Weddle, C.J. Mosley, Zadaria Smith, and the legendary Terrell Suggs, to name a few. But with losing Eric Weddle, they lost a defensive mind that really could not be replicated. Weddle's play had deteriorated over the last few years, and while Weddle is loved throughout the Baltimore community, Earl Thomas just brings a different dimension. He is extremely smart. He is able to really lead a defense in a way that not a lot of people can, but he's a quiet leader is what he is. He's not going to yell and scream and be animated. He's going to go out there and he's going to do his job. And coincidentally, I had, and coincidentally, I thought that the Ravens had no shot at Earl. So I was pinning for Tyron Matthew and that was the guy that was number one on my board for safeties. (laughs) I wanted Tyron Matthew. And then when he went to the Chiefs and, Le'Veon went to the Jets. Ravens fans were starting to get worried because those were the top two targets. And Earl Thomas really was an afterthought for the Ravens because he was going to be too expensive. But with CJ Mosley leaving in free agency, the Ravens had the money to go and offer Earl a big deal. And the rumors, you know, as Chiefs fans are very familiar with, came out that Earl was on the way to sign a one-year deal with Kansas City. And then the Ravens came calling with that big money contract that he had been looking for. But what Earl has brought to the team so far, he has only actually had two total tackles. But the reason for that is because the defense has been game planning away from him because they know that he can cover so much ground and they know that he can be an impact player. I mean, in his second defensive series, he had an interception against Ryan Fitzpatrick and those Dolphins. So while Earl might not be stuffing the stat sheet right now, his leader, his leadership and his veteran presence has really been a calming presence for these young guys and i'm excited to see what earl brings not only on the field but also off of it so when you look at what this game is going to mean for baltimore you know you've already we've already kind of talked about what we think that the score outcome could end up being what do you think how do you think that the offense is going to try to attack this chief's defense because kansas City's defense looked horrible the first half or the first quarter of oakland but they solidified in the last three quarters and it really kind of gives me a different expectation as to what they could do. There's going to be a lot of RPOs, in my opinion. I think that the Ravens really want to start off this game by winning it on the ground, by pounding the ball down the Chiefs' throats and making those defensive linemen tired. You know, talking about some of the studs the Chiefs have on this defense, Chris Jones and Frank Clark we talked about a little earlier, but I think that if they really pound the ball down the Chiefs' throats during the first few quarters the Ravens like their players to be fresh and how the Ravens do that is by having depth at a lot of positions at running back the Ravens have Mark Ingram Gus Edwards and Justice Hill who they rotate in and out a cornerback when Jimmy Smith is healthy he's not going to be for this week but the Ravens rotate Smith Brandon Carr Marlon Humphrey in and out they rotate tight ends out they have three solid ones so but late in the fourth quarter when you know maybe Chris Jones has played 65 70 snaps You have Mark Ingram, who's only played 40 and is still a little fresher than that defensive line. And so he'll come in and he'll pound and the defense will just won't be ready for it. They'll be too tired. So I expect that. But, you know, that would have been the that would have been my whole answer last year. But this year with Lamar's improvement as a passer, I expect a lot of Mark Andrews. A name for Chiefs fan to watch is Mark Andrews. Lamar Jackson's favorite target, the tight end out of Oklahoma, has been a monster over these first two games. And I don't expect that to change. He's a tight end who is a deep threat. He's a tight end who can catch the ball. And the Ravens love to just find him in the middle of the field for nice 20-yard chunk gains. And 
They also have Hayden Hurst, the first round pick out of South Carolina, Nick Boyle, who's a good blocker. They employ all these three tight end sets where you think they're just going to run it, but then they run one out in the flat, one on a slant, and one on the out. And, you know, the Chiefs have to be ready for it. So I expect a lot of running, but I also expect Lamar to find his tight ends. Andrews, by the way, won me a fantasy game. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Sit down this week, <laughs> will you? Uh, my question is going to be, if you're the offensive coordinator and you're looking at this Chiefs defense, you, you mentioned RPOs. And is this really the game where they try to let Jackson run free? Is it truly an option? Or how are you trying to attack this Kansas City defense? It's, it's really all about game flow because the Ravens don't want to label this offense. They don't want to give Jackson a set playbook right from the get-go. They want to see how the game continues, how the game evolves in front of their eyes. And what the rate, what the, what one Dolphins player said at the end of the game was the game plan for the Dolphins was to pretty much let Lamar Jackson beat them with his arm. And the Ravens saw they were stacking the box. And I mean, Lamar did beat him with his arm. They had over, he had five touchdowns over 300 yards passing. But if I'm the offensive coordinator and I have to pick an area to attack, I am probably targeting the Chiefs secondary just because, as you guys alluded to, they're still trying to find themselves. And while there's a lot of talent there with Tyron Matthew, Brashad Breeland, Kyle Fuller, a lot of these guys, I think that if Marquise Brown can burn for a few, because the Chiefs are going to have to respect Hollywood's speed and make sure that they have him accounted for on every play. Lamar and Hollywood actually grew up in the same county in Florida. They are very good friends. They practice together all the time. They have a very good chemistry going on. So. I'd probably attack with Hollywood Brown. We also have big receivers like Willie Sneed and Miles Boykin. Miles Boykin being a third-round pick out of Notre Dame, who Lamar just throws jump balls to, and they come down with him. Willie Sneed can be a guy in the slot. So the Ravens have a lot of players and a lot of wide receivers, a lot of pass catchers who do a lot of different things. Not one of them is really a star at this moment. But what the Ravens like is they have a lot of players who can do you know, one can run a deep route, one can run a slant, one can run deep out. So there are a lot of different things. So the Chiefs secondary will have to be prepared for everything the Ravens offense bring to the table. My last question to you is when you look at what this Chiefs offense has done the first two weeks, how do you try to stop it? Because at this point, Kansas City looked like they took the foot off the gas a little bit in the second half against Oakland, or I think they could have put up 40, 45 points pretty easy. Uh, I think they, you know, kind of tried to run the ball a little bit more than they intended to. But how would you attack this offense? Because the way they're playing, Patrick Mahomes is on a different level. I mean, my question is, is there any way to stop Patrick Mahomes? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's an answer to that question, and it might be no. But if I had to choose a way to attack this Chiefs defense, it'd be through blitzes. I know that Mahomes is also can also be adept as a runner and can really run when he needs to. But what I would do, because Don Wink Martindale, the Ravens defensive coordinator, dials up these exotic blitz packages that Rookie quarterbacks I've never seen before, and that's really why the Ravens have been so successful against younger quarterbacks. I'm not saying Mahomes is a younger quarterback at this moment, but you know players like Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, all those guys, it's just looks that they've never seen, and they've even confused some veteran quarterbacks with it because they'll stack the box with nine people, and then they'll drop five or six back into coverage, or they'll have a lot of players blitz off the edge. So I'm just trying to confuse Patrick Mahomes in any way I can because if you just give him a set-based defense, he's going to pick it apart. I mean, we've seen it over the first two games here. Last season, we saw it with, in the Ravens game. Last season, first the Chiefs. It's just Mahomes is a different player. He's on a field all by himself. And as a Ravens fan, you really just don't know, you know, you, you look at his game against Oakland, 443 yards and four touchdowns. The Ravens have been blessed with Lamar Jackson. But the Chiefs fans have a blessing of their own in this Patrick Mahomes guy. And, you know, the Ravens fans, when they, say, then when they saw Tyree Kill go out with an injury and the problems that Tyree Kill gave Baltimore last year, you know, they thought, oh, we'll, we'll trade Tyree Kill for Jimmy Smith. Both aren't playing. That's fine. Well, then Nico Hardman comes and Robinson comes and there are just so many weapons on the Chiefs offense. So if I had to stop Patrick Mahomes, I just try to blitz and bring all the pressure that they can get around these offensive linemen down Eric Fisher and see what they can do. Well, folks, that's the way that we see it. Please check out the rest of this show, Locked On Ravens, Locked On Chiefs. Check out the competition, as well as there's a crossover show today, Wednesday, for every matchup that's coming next week. Kevin, thanks for your time. Folks, thanks for listening to us today, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or Google Play. Follow the show on Twitter, at Locked On Chiefs. Check out my work at RGR Football on YouTube. Chris's work on LockedOnChiefs.com and all of Seth's film analysis at TheAthletic.com. Thanks for listening.